Hello, and thank you so much for having me here, and thanks for the conference organizers for inviting me, and to Womatic for sponsoring the talk. Um, this is, I think, the 14th continuous year I've come to this conference, and it's always a great fun to have a chance to learn from all my colleagues around the state. Um, so today, uh, I'd like to talk about open educational resources, and more generally, I want to talk about uh, open, uh, you know, open educational resources, open textbooks, and to a lesser extent, uh, open learning and, and open pedagogy. Uh, my own interest in open began with open source software. Uh, to me, the, the idea is fascinating. Uh, to the end user, the main driver is cost. Uh, free as in, you know, free beer. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but for the techie, the bigger driver is, is the ability to study and modify the code, the, the Libra, the freedoms that are provided by, by open source. And, and for big projects, there was this community of developers uh, contributing to the creation of the project, often not because it was their job, but because they cared about it. Uh, and by pooling their skills, uh, they could create a better product faster than any one person working alone. And to me, this is really the promise of open. Uh, Cable Green, who some of you may know from his former role at our state board, uh, who's now with Creative Commons, uh, likes to give this analogy. Uh, imagine that we could build, we could build a food machine that could, that could make food with a marginal cost near zero. You know, would we invest the money to create that machine? And I think we'd have to say, of course we would. What we have in our hands is the ability to create learning materials that we can then distribute with a marginal cost near zero. Uh, the question is whether we want to invest the money and the time uh, to build that learning machine, and I don't really know what that is, but whatever. <laughs> I couldn't find a learning machine, so. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so why are we talking about this? Uh, we all know how expensive textbooks are. Um, textbook prices have been incre increasing much faster than inflation, the top one there is the book textbooks, the bottom one is the CPI. Um, students are spending an average of $1,100 a year on textbooks. Um, that's about 25% of tuition at my school. Uh, additionally, online homework access codes force students to buy new books or pay a cost that basically makes it as if they're buying a new book. Uh, and, and then this whole promise of digital books, you know, has really resulted in these time-bombed books where students don't have access to the materials at the end of the quarter. So, you know, in the next class, they can't go back and review the material they learned in the previous class. And even then, they're still like $75 to $100. For me, I really became aware of the cost impact to students when reading scholarship applications for a math textbook program we run at our college. Uh, I would regularly read statements like these. Uh, this past spring quarter from Math 60, I didn't have the book the entire quarter, and I barely scraped by. Uh, if I continue this way, I'll surely fail in Math 98, the next course. Another student, I'm afraid that if I can't or don't get this book before the college quarter starts, I will fall behind and possibly even fail the course. And, and these anecdotes from my own experience have been supported by, by research done around the country. A study in Florida found that 31% of students cho chose to not register for a course due to cost. 14% had dropped a course due to cost. Um, and a similar study from the student purge group more recently, over four, 13 different campuses, found that 70% of students said they skipped buying the books at least once due to cost, even though they knew that that would end up impacting them. What this is causing is an access inequity in a system that prides itself on open access. For me as a teacher, one of my other concerns is that of, of what I call mainstreamed materials. Um, because publishers, very understandably, are looking for adoptions, uh, content tends to, to move towards the middle over time. Uh, a great example of this is the Hughes Hallett Calculus book. I mean, if you look back at the, the first edition that I took calculus out of, uh, I mean, it was a really radical departure from traditional calculus, and you look at the versions now, and every version seems to, seems to be creeping closer and closer, closer to looking like Stuart. Right? It seems to be creeping towards, towards the middle. Uh, and along with that, you get what I call content creep. Um, you know, publishers add a new topic to the book because some college in Kansas says, oh, we can't use the book if this topic's not in it. 
Uh, so the publisher adds a topic, and then you adopt the book, and, well, the topic's in the book, so I guess I should teach it. And then three years later, you're revising your outcomes, and everyone's like, hey, why isn't this topic in our outcomes? We better add it. And next thing you know, you got a new topic in your outcomes because some people in Kansas wanted that topic. Um, so let's talk about open educational resources, or OER, as you'll hear me call it. Um, you know, what does OER mean? So, so just to clear up a couple things, open is not equivalent to digital, uh, and open is not equivalent to free. Um, I, we're math people, maybe a Venn diagram would help. So, uh, so, so open is a proper subset of free. Things that are, you know, everything that's open is free, or at least freely available. Um, but there's tons of stuff out there on the internet that is free, but not open. Uh, and, and while most of the benefits of open come in the form of digital materials, certainly you can have print versions of, of open materials as well. It doesn't have to be digital. So what open really is, is, is a legal framework for sharing. It's this uh, idea that, uh, of these permissions, what we call the five R's. Uh, the ability to retain, uh, the ability to keep a copy of the materials so that your students at the end of the quarter can hold on to that copy of the materials. They can own it. They can have a copy on their flash drive. Uh, the ability to reuse materials, the ability to take the materials and reuse them in their existing form. The ability to revise materials. You don't like that definition, you can go in and change the definition. You don't like that example, you can go change the example. It's the ability to revise materials. Uh, again, this is not something that you can do with just some free stuff out on the internet. It's still copyrighted. You're not allowed to do this. Open says you are allowed to do this. That's what open licensing allows. Uh, to remix. So remix is taking material from multiple sources and combining it together. So, you know, uh, you know our pre-calc book doesn't cover conics. You need conics? Great. We go to this other book and we bring in some material on conics and we can combine it together to make exactly what we need. And then lastly is the right to redistribute, the ability to take the materials and then share them out. And this is what allows us to give our students copies for free, right? the ability to redistribute the materials. Uh, the easiest way to identify open resources is through the Creative Commons licenses. Creative Commons licenses were created about 10 years ago, 15, 12, I don't know, somewhere around there. Um, and, and they allow a creator to explicitly state the permissions that they're allowing. When you create a worksheet and you pop it out there on the internet, even if you put it on a publicly accessible website, it is copywritten, right? And, and you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, that, that was just the, the, the culture, right? We would just, oh, somebody put something out there. Great, I'm going to use it, right? And, and no one ever questioned it. Now, I go to my print shop and they're like, okay, where's your proof of permission to copy this? Right? I mean, it's that, that's what open licensing gives, is the explicit permission to use the materials that way. Um, so th these are the, the most common Creative Commons open licenses. Each of them gives certain you know, levels of permission, from sort of most permissive to least permissive. The CC BY license or attribution license up there on the upper left says, hey, you can use this however you want as long as you give me credit for it. Uh, so you have to attribute it back to the original creator. Uh, the one on the right there adds a share alike clause. It requires that if you redistribute it, you have to keep it under that same open license. You can't make it more restrictive. Uh, and then the bottom two there add what's called a non-commercial clause. It says you're not allowed to use this for any commercial purposes. Um, it's really tempting as educators to like want to use that non-commercial clause to say, yeah, I don't want Pearson stealing my stuff and making money off of it. I hate to tell you this, it's probably not going to happen. But the, 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 the biggest problem with the non-commercial clause is that it causes problems for printing. I mean, I, I, we took some materials to our print shop recently. It had the non-commercial clause on it, and they were like, I don't know if we can print this because we're going to be selling it through the bookstore. Yeah, they can, but they were still worried about it. Anyway, the point is that these licenses allow the author to easily indicate that they're okay with others using their materials without having to ask permission. And, and that whole without having to ask is really important. I've run into a bunch of works where I think the person intended it to be used freely, but they didn't openly license it, and I can't find them. And now I can't use it because it's copywritten. Okay, so, so what, are, what does OER look like? Um, the most obvious example, perhaps, is an open textbook. This would be an entire sort of traditional-looking textbook, but with an open license on it. 
Uh, but there's a lot more to OER than that. There's worksheets, handouts, activities, videos, uh, pre-built courses, all sorts of things uh, that, that qualify as open resources. It doesn't have to be just a, just a textbook. Okay, and believe it or not, that was the foundation. And so now we have the foundation laid, we can jump into the fun part, uh, making a case for open. Why should you do open? Uh, I'm going to lay out three arguments. The first, the most obvious, I think, is cost savings. For an example of this, let's turn to our friends at Green River, who uh, have adopted an open source 141 book. So they offered, it, I hope I got this right off your website, 27 sections of 141 a year. If we imagine about 30 students per section and you know, we imagine that instead they were buying Stuart off of Amazon, uh, that's the full retail price of Stuart on Amazon minus the cost of buying a printed OER book. Uh, you know, that comes out to $162,000 that they're saving students in one year for one course. And it's more than just saving money. This, this is a quote from Mike Kenyon at Green River uh, from an MA review. You know, the text had a positive effect on the classroom instructional atmosphere from the very beginning. Uh, you know, many students came to class the first day with a positive attitude, born of having been to the bookstore and found that their textbook would cost $20 rather than over 100 And even spending that much was optional. Moreover, the vast majority of students had the textbook in one form or another from the outset and didn't face the prospect of falling behind because they couldn't get it until the financial aid check came in. And for me, that students having access to the materials day one is a really, really essential piece of this. I mean, to me, this is a simple way that we as faculty can address access inequity. And I know that there are those who think that we shouldn't have to do this, uh, that think that the state should put more money towards, towards education and lower tuition and that's the right way to save students money. And, and I'd love to see that happen, but all I can do about that is lobby my legislator. I have no direct control over that. With textbooks, I have direct control and I individually can make a difference in whether my students have access to their materials. My second argument is going to be a little bit more philosophical. Uh, it starts with this idea that education is sharing. Uh, and you know, teachers share knowledge and skills, feedback and criticism and encouragement. Students share their assignments and, and feedback. If there's no sharing, there's no education. So, so what can be shared without giving it away? Anybody? Knowledge. <laughs> knowledge can be given without, can be shared without giving it away, but, that's not true of physical expressions of, of knowledge. So, you know, if I have a newspaper and I'm reading the sports page, you know, no one else can read that sports page until I'm done with it. But with digital materials, like, you know, we can all go to CNN.com and read the same article at the same time, right? That's something that, that the internet has enabled us. And, and, and so we have this unprecedented capacity now to share as never before, which gives us this unprecedented capacity to educate as never before. Except we can't, because what the internet enables, copyright forbids. Copyright doesn't allow us to do that sharing. It cancels the, co the possibilities of digital media and the internet. So what do we do? We, we take a cue from judo and, and use our opponent's strength against us. Uh, and that's what Creative Commons really is. It is, it, like I said, it's a legal framework, so it's building on top of copyright law uh, as a way of enforcing sharing. And, and, and so what inter the internet enables, OER allows, and which gives us the ability to then share and educate uh, at an unprecedented scale. My last argument is a bit selfish control. Uh, at the most basic level, this is about avoiding frustration. Uh, for online materials, this means things like no broken links. It means uh, bec because I can retain a copy. I don't have to link out to somebody else's material. I can keep a copy in my LMS. Uh, it, likewise, it means no surprise changes. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden that page I've been linking to is going to have a bunch of ads on it. it, it that page I'm linking to is suddenly going to be behind a paywall because I have access and control over that material. Uh, and compared to commercial text, it has this nice little benefit of no force new additions. It means that if I'm happy with the material I'm using, I can just keep using it for as long as I want to. 
And if I don't like it, I can fix it for next quarter or next year instead of having to wait three years for a new version. But there's more than that. I mean, OER really gives this freedom. It it gives this freedom to make changes. It allows us to add content, to remove sections uh, that we don't need. It lets us modify definitions, examples, uh, whatever you like to change. Uh, OER gives us this freedom to innovate with the curriculum. For example, I taught an elementary algebra class last year. Um, I used an open textbook for reference and and for the videos and homework that were connected with it. Um, But since it's not a commercial book, I I felt more free to to leave material out, to supplement the book, and and to some extent ignore the book altogether, something that I would feel pretty guilty doing if my students were paying $200 for it. But, you know, it's an open book. I didn't really worry about it. And and so I could customize the materials to be what I wanted to. Just as as one tiny example, I I really hate this problem. Uh, It's the classic investment problem, right? Bob has money in two accounts, earns some interest, how much was in each account. I'm sorry, but we all know the right answer, right? It's read your statements, Bob. Right, uh, but but because it's because it's OER, you know, I could change the question. You know, now Bob's retiring, and and here's a safe CD account and a risky bond account, but he needs a certain amount of money to live on. So how much should he put in each account? Right now, we can't. We, there's no statements to read. Right, a simple rewording, and suddenly we're solving a meaningful decision-making problem. You know, OER let me change the materials to be what I wanted in the course. It also provides the ability to to customize and and localize, and and this really changes the textbook adoption process, or the, I should really call it the course materials adoption process, uh, because instead of, you know, the traditional thing we do, which is searching through dozens of books for the perfect table of contents, and you flip through a book, it's like, oh, no, this one's missing a topic, whoosh, Uh, no, no, this one's got too much, whoosh, Uh, you know, instead we can, we can, mix contents from multiple texts to create a perfect match for our outcomes. And as a small plug, we're doing a talk on that on Saturday morning, if you want to know about how to do that. Uh, so, so, so all these great benefits, and hopefully at this point you're saying, yay, I'm sold, show me the goods. So, so let's do that. Uh, and we're going to do that by sort of looking at where we've come from, where we're at now, and, and what's coming down the road. It's a little bit of the sort of the story of, of the OER movement, if you will. So in the beginning, there were, uh, if any of you were searching around the internet for free books back in, let's say, 2004, even, you know, even 10 years ago, uh, the main thing you would find are these really obscure books, right? You'd find stuff that people put online probably because the publisher rejected it, because it was too non-mainstream. Uh, an example of this I remember looking at back in 2006 or so was, was this one. It's calculus introduced through difference equations. I mean, it's a really cool idea, but there's no way my department would let me use it. Uh, and and, and you know, then there's this. So this is the string text from MIT, uh, you know, which you can probably see is quite obviously a scan of a, of a printed book and completely ineditable, right? All I can do is use it. I mean, I can't even exercise most of those open rights, even though it was openly licensed. Uh, you might remember MIT OpenCourseWare, which of course is still around, but I mean, it was one of the first sort of big examples of an open project, right? Uh, what they envisioned originally as a resource for te- faculty ended up being used much more by students and in many ways just as a promotional product for the, by the colleges. Um, and sadly, very few of the courses actually used open textbooks. Most of them used commercial books. So you would read through it and it would be, uh, read chapter three out of the book and do these homework problems out of the book. <laughs> and so what you got out of it was these hour long lectures. We all know students love to listen to hour long video lectures, right? Uh, and, and, and maybe a few PDF assignments. And some of those were kind of useful, but I mean, that's, that's about the extent of you know, sort of what seemed useful there. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention WebWork, which is an, an, op- an early open source online homework system out of the University of Rochester, started around 1999. Uh, it's super duper cool, still used by a lot of universities. Um, back when I was first got interested in the idea of getting away from commercial online homework systems, I looked at this and said, wow, this is really cool and there's no way my IT department could set this up. Uh, and, and, and that's really what set the stage for, for how I started getting involved in Open, which was with WAMAP. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, 
uh, WAMAP is an open source online homework system uh, with web hosting supported initially by Bill Moore from the Transition Math Project and now by the State Board eLearning Council, or no, eLearning Division Department, whatever you call it. Um, and it started with this simple idea. It started with the idea that I didn't want students, to, I, I wanted students to be able to buy used books. I didn't want them to have to buy a new book in order to get the, uh, the online access code. Uh, so we got a little bit of funding from the eLearning Council. Um, me and uh, David Whitaker from Cascadia at the time uh, laid the foundation with the first like thousand questions. Uh, he got me connected with uh, Seattle Central, uh, where a num bunch of folks grew jumped on board and we started writing questions. We got some grant funding from the Transition Math Project, which gave me some time to work on all this uh, and to compensate a little bit people to help work on some of the content development. Um, but what was really awesome about WAMAP, I think, is, is that a, a community of users formed. You know, even after the money was gone, people kept on creating content because it was useful to them. Uh, and they were sharing it freely so that other people could build off of their work. Making it better for everyone. And that continues to happen now. We're up to over 50,000 questions now that faculty members from around the state have created. Uh, so th through those efforts, we've got all those questions, we've got dozens of course templates, and, and like Rosalie mentioned, WAMAP alone is serving over 15,000 students a quarter now. So since 2001, way back when, I had been teaching Math 107 online. Uh, around 2008, I decided to move my online homework from the, for the course from I think it was Blackboard at the time, uh, into, into WAMAP. And then it felt really ridiculous that my students were paying $150 for a book where we only covered half the book and we weren't even using the exercises. And, and I said to myself, there's gotta be a better way. Uh, and so I sat down over a couple months and I just wrote out replacements for the narrative texts of, of the sections I was using. And, and that was my, my first open book uh, math and Society. At the time, it was nine chapters, about 80 pages, uh, no exercises, but you know, it met the needs of my online class. And and having been involved with open source software, I said, great, let's openly license this, put this out there in case if anyone else might wanna might wanna take advantage of it. About that same time, around 2008-ish, I would say, the OER movement really started kicking off. Uh, it really started getting big, if you will. Uh, around, around that time, the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, uh, which, which is based out of California, I think they called themselves Open Doors Group at the time, uh, started holding workshops. I remember I attended one up at North Seattle uh, Community College, uh, and they were trying to encourage people to use OER. Uh, the problem was, OER was hard to find, and there wasn't a lot out there, and, and people got frustrated. Uh, you know, here, here the presenters were talking about, oh, OER is great, OER is awesome, there's all this great OER and nobody can find any, uh, right? It was hard. But luckily, things would, would quickly change. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on things that affect the math world. Uh, if you're interested in things outside of math, I, I can tell you more later. Uh, so one of the more interesting ones was ck12.org was founded. Um, they were working to build K-12 level uh, open educational resources and a platform that was supposed to allow for, for easy remixing. And, and several really cool things came out of that work. Uh, one of them was David Wiley down in Utah founded uh, the Open High School of Utah, a, a charter school, uh, with the intent of researching the effectiveness of open textbooks. And, and they were able to find through their research, by the way, th this was a high school where every, all the courses were taught using OER and only OER. Uh, so they found that students performed uh, just as well uh, using the open textbooks as students using, in other places, using tra uh, traditional books. Uh, and this prompted the state of Utah to adopt open textbooks for several math and science courses. Uh, and it's now being, they're now being used statewide in Utah and there's several other states uh, starting to go down that same path. Uh, at the community college level, uh, instructors at a number of community colleges have used their materials uh, for developmental level classes, since it's basically the same level, right? Uh, James Souza down in Phoenix, for example, uh, built an intro algebra text using their materials as well as an intermediate algebra. Another cool project uh, around the same time was Siavula. This is a company based in South Africa. 
Uh, they brought teachers from around the country together to do these big content building sprints. Uh, and they built open materials, localized and customized for their country. And, and then the government ended up adopting the texts and has now distributed millions of these textbooks across South Africa. Uh, and, then, and then in 2010, uh, the State Board announced an ambitious project, uh, the Open Course Library Project. Uh, the goal was simple, it, let's build complete open courses for the 81 highest enrolled courses in the state. The theory was brilliant, it really was. It recognized that the hardest part of adopting open materials was finding them, vetting them, and, and then building assessments and other support materials around them. Right, so that was sort of the idea behind the, 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 the project. Uh, unfortunately, the reality didn't quite match the vision. Uh, they, they allowed faculty to use cheap, under $30 commercial texts, and unfortunately, a lot of the people did. Uh, so, so many of the open courses that were created um, aren't much more useful than those MIT open courseware courses in the end. Luckily for all of us, the math team didn't go that route. The math team ended up creating complete open courses, including an open text, homework and WAMAP, and in some cases, sample tests, worksheets, instructor guides, and other resources. Uh, really complete open courses. Uh, in the first round, uh, there's two phases of the open course library. In the first phase, Tyler Wallace from Big Ben created the beginning and intermediate algebra course. Uh, it's got a book and an accompanying student solutions manual, and while those things are nice, Honestly, what's really cool about his course is that he designed it to support a lab or a flipped class modality. So he built these video lessons where the students watch videos and then answer questions tied to the videos. And it, they're actually using it at Big Bend for uh, an Emporium style course now, or at least they've adapted his original work for what they're using now. For pre-calc and trig, uh, Melanie Rasmussen and I wrote uh, this text, taking a contextually motivated approach to the story of functions. Uh, we accompanied it with a, uh, a, course of, uh, a course of WAMAP exercises, worksheets, sample assessments, instructor notes, and a variety of other resources. Uh, for calculus, Dale Hoffman from Bellevue College took a book he had been working on for a while and, and, and polished it up and made it really pretty and, and, and did a lot of other nice improvements on that. In the second round of the Open Course Library, I had a chance to expand my 107 book with a number of new chapters, up to 16 now, uh, partly thanks to contributions from other people around the state. Uh, Jeff Eldridge from Edmonds, Lawrence Morales from Seattle Central, and Mike Kenyon from Green River all contrib contributed material that I was able to incorporate into that text. Uh, and I was able to create a new set of videos uh, to go along with the online course that I'd already set, uh, started building. Uh, for business calculus, Shauna Calloway from Shoreline did something really cool because she took Dale's book, Dale's calculus book, and, and did what Open allows us to do. She remixed it. She, she, she revised it. She was able to trim it, tweak, and add to it to turn it into a business calculus book. Uh, so after we created all these courses, and they were cool, uh, it seemed like a shame for the only people to be able to benefit them was folks in Washington because of WAMAP and, and word of mouth and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and, and so, so I, around that time I launched my open map, which is a free to the world version of WAMAP, uh, but only focused on supporting open textbooks rather than WAMAP, which supports whatever you want it to. Now, I should say, meanwhile, during that three-year period I was just describing, uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on out there. There's a bunch of op other open textbooks that came into existence or popped out of the woodwork, things like a uh, college algebra book from uh, Stitz and Zager out in Ohio, uh, and, and, and uh, Flat World Knowledge uh, was this uh, used-to-be open publisher that produced materials for tons of disciplines. They made a huge impact everywhere except for math. Other stuff for math wasn't that great. Uh, but with all this, OER was becoming, was becoming more recognized, uh, and desires to simplify adoption were becoming more prevalent. Uh, and, and, and there's been different ways to try to encourage adoption. Uh, some of it tried to address this through repositories or collections of resources. 
Um, Merlot has been around for a really long time. Uh, if you went to any of those early OER workshops, you probably learned about Merlot, and you probably realized it's almost useless to find anything because they, they list everything, every grain size, from small, tiny workshop uh, worksheet to huge textbook, and it's really hard to find anything. Um, Connection from Rice University was another early OER um, player. Uh, if you're familiar with the book Collaborative Statistics, uh, it was uh, housed at Connections. Uh, it, it tried to be an everything platform. It tried to be, you know, a search. It tried to be housing. It tried to be uh, editing. Their editing system was absolutely atrocious and horrible. Uh, and they only allowed the most free license, the attribution-only license. Uh, and so they got a lot less use than I think they probably would have liked to have gotten. Uh, college Open Textbooks. Dot. Org. Uh, it was a different kind of listing. This came around in maybe 2008, 9. Uh, and and it, was, it came out of that OER training effort. And, and it was sort of this first consolidated list of almost youth things that kind of looked like textbooks. It was a list of like 500 resources across all disciplines, uh, most of which looked kind of like a textbook. Uh, and, and, and it was sort of a good, good start. Um, they tried to get people to do reviews, but they never had much luck. Uh, more recently, the, the Minnesota University of Minnesota started an uh, open textbook library where they're listing uh, really vetted open textbooks. They're getting faculty to do reviews. Also, BC campus up in British Columbia has started their own listing uh, that's even more restricted. It's books that their faculty have gone through and reviewed and, and feel are appropriate to be used. Uh, specific to math, the American Institute of Mathematics maintains a reviewed uh, set of open textbooks, though I have to say that their review perspective comes from a university angle. I don't necessarily agree with all their opinions. Uh, and, and, and then I, I maintain a site called opentextbookstore.com, which lists a bunch of open textbooks as well. And the cool thing about all this and all the publicity that's been going on is, is this increased awareness of OER uh, and it bringing like-minded people together. Um, a great example is the Maricopa District down in, down in the Phoenix area of Arizona. Uh, they've jumped on the bandwagon big time. Uh, they set up their own version of WAMAP for their district, uh, and, and Scottsdale Community College set out to replace commercial books in, in all of their courses starting with DevEd. Uh, and so they used a combination of the CK12.org materials, material from the Open Course Library, and, and they've done a whole bunch of original work creating workbooks to accompany those. Uh, and, and they went completely OER and developmental in under a year. And as any great community should, they shared back everything they've created. Uh, and, and we share back, and, and, and there's this great community of users where, where we all sort of pull, the, pull together these resources that are being created. Uh, one of the really cool things that came out of connecting with Maricopa was, was connecting up with, with James Souza, who, who, if you've ever gone to anything from Math is Power for You, uh, .com, uh, and he, he, that, that's him. He, he is a madman, I would say. He's created over 3,500 videos. Uh, from arithmetic or differential equations, uh, and, and he started tying his videos to questions uh, in WAMAP. Uh, so that then you get a WAMAP problem, there's a little get help, and you click the button and up pops a video. Uh, so he had been doing this for his own algebra class, he's like, oh hey, I'm going to do college algebra next. I was like, oh great, want to start with our course? Uh, and that's exactly what he did, is he took our course, went through and added videos to like 75% of the questions and created these overview videos for each section. And, and you know, again, this great collaboration where you know, we contributed one piece of work and he's contributed another. And it's created this great product in the end. Uh, and I'm, I'm also super excited to mention that thanks to some other collaborators down in Santa Ana, uh, a, a very large number of James videos are now closed captioned as well. Uh, so another really cool step came. Oh, uh, yeah, that was an example of the videos. Uh, <laughs> another cool step came from the Kaleidoscope Project, which is a next generation learning challenge funded project. Uh, so a lot of grant money had been going towards creation of open resources, 
but not a lot had been going towards adoption. And so that's where Kaleidoscope focused. So their goal was we're going to pull together multiple faculty members from multiple campuses, different multiple colleges, bring them together and say, build an OER course. Build an OER course using existing open resources. So this wasn't about creating new materials, it was about adapting and adopting existing materials. So for beginning and intermediate algebra, they ended up finding Tyler Wallace's algebra materials and my open math, uh, and they made some modifications to those and started adopting those. Uh, so I ended up getting connected up with Lumen Learning, which is the company that's managing the Kaleidoscope project, uh, through that. And, and, and so I've been working with them, I've been on leave this last year working with them on the second round of the Kaleidoscope project, which, which had the goal of completing the rest of the freshman level, basically the community college sequence of, of courses, at least the freshman level and developmental. Uh, and, and so last summer it was really fun. We brought together over a dozen faculty from, I think, eight different institutions uh, to collaborate on developing the rest of that sequence. Uh, in all the cases, we started with op existing open textbooks, um, some of them based on the open course library courses, some of them based on CK12, some of them based on other stuff we had found out and about. Uh, a lot of them were based on courses that either James Souza or somebody in Washington had already created, so we had starting points. Uh, and, and we were able to collaborate on this development. I, I mean, for example, with calculus, it's been really fun. Dale Hoffman up at Bellevue and Jeff Eldridge over at Edmonds and me and James Souza down in Arizona. Uh, we were able to all collaborate together to sort of expand out the, the online homework uh, to accompany Dale's book uh, to make it a little bit more um, you know, complete and traditional looking in terms of aligning with every single section. Um, in Applied Calc, we were able to pull additional material from Dale's book and from other sources to build out what Sean had already started into something that covered some more outcomes that other colleges had that weren't originally included. Uh, the only course that's not done yet, I'll mention, is statistics. Uh, uh, it, at least not the one I want yet, which is the one based on the open intro text. It's a great text. Um, and, and some of these courses now have multiple text options as well. And of course, while all this was going on, sort of all this sort of stuff, there was a ton of other little projects going on out there. Uh, you know, stuff that individual people or departments were doing. Um, you know, Tope Anderson up in Everett was experimenting with using MIT OpenCourseWare for calculus and was working on a stats course using online statbook.com. Uh, James Gray in Seattle had been working, uh, been using the Carnegie OLI stats course and, and has been recreating the entire thing in WAMAP. Uh, like I mentioned, Jeff Eldridge up at Edmonds has been working on a stats course, um, primarily, partially based on the open intro text and partially his own stuff. He's also been working on relaying out Dale's book in, in text so that it looks a little prettier. And I have to say thank him greatly for sending me over a thousand edits to our pre-calc book. In my defense, most of them were periods that I left off at the end of sentences. Uh, uh, Pete Kaslik at my, at my college has been using his own sustainability-based 107 materials for several years and is currently working on his own stats book. Lawrence Morales at Seattle Central wrote his own book on the history of math. Uh, several years ago, and and there's a bunch of other examples out there in the system. So I apologize if I forgot what you are working on, or if I've never heard about it. If I haven't heard about it, then I would love to hear about it. Uh, catch me and tell me. So with all this going on, the the natural question to be asking, the question that people always ask about open resources, is, yeah, but is it any good, right? Because because you, know, you don't want to use something that's not any good. As with all things, that depends upon how you measure quality. So typically, when we evaluate texts, you know, what do you look for? Usually you look for you know, a nice table of contents, you look for clear examples, you look for a pleasing layout. And, and all that stuff is great, but really those are proxies for quality. I, I'm of the opinion that there's no reason to use a proxy for quality when we can actually measure student success. And so let's look at some student success. 
Um, so from the high school world, I, I mentioned the open high school, um, high school of Utah. So there's a bunch of research from the high school level. All of that showed uh, no statistically significant difference between using OER and using a commercial text. Um, Scottsdale Community College used OER for a year. They analyzed their data and no statistically significant difference between what they've been doing before and, and using OER. Um, for my 107 class, I don't have a lot of data here, just my own data. Uh, you know, a few years, you know, I saw a little bit of increase in success rate, but surprise, surprise, not statistically significantly different. Um, Dale has some data from Bellevue College for his calculus. Again, not statistically significantly different. Uh, for uh, pre-calc, we were able to look at 5,000 students using our book at uh, Pierce, Green River, and Shoreline. The, the three places that have done departmental adoptions. Uh, uh, so we looked at them over the last two years compared, compared to 5,000 using commercial books before that. And again, saw no statistically significant difference in success while saving students $300,000. And I'm kind of okay with that. I'm okay with no difference if I'm saving students a bunch of money. Um, interestingly, the one place that we have seen some potential success is in algebra. Um, Big Bend switched, uh, as I said, entirely to an Emporium-based model uh, based on an extension of Tyler's original open work. Uh, they've seen their success rates jump from 48 to 75 percent and withdrawal rate drop from 25 to 9 percent, though I have a feeling that that's largely due to the format change uh, as much as the content. I mean, it's a little hard to parse out the content there. Uh, some other data on algebra, this is from the Kaleidoscope uh, Project Round 1. This is from Mercy College out in New York. Uh, so they were using um, my math lab with a Pearson textbook, and then they did a six-section pilot of uh, open resources based on Tyler's material. They saw enough success that they went full-scale, full departmental adoption, about 40 sections a, a, a semester, if I remember right. And uh, on the right there is the uh, you know, conglomerated data of before OER and after OER. They saw about an 8% uh, increase in success. Why is, you know, is it the content? Is it because they had access to the materials day one? Is it because of random flukes? I don't know, uh, but, but it's promising. And of course there's more than, I mean, we're math people. We like quantitative data, but there's a lot more than that as well. Um, you know, when we've done surveys about like, how did you like the material? Was it easy to read? Things like that. Students generally are very positive about it. Um, Jeff Eldridge sent me, sent me this nice quote. Uh, the student feedback I've received in the texts that I and others used, as well as the associated WAMAP materials in James Hughes' videos have been virtually 100% positive. And it's not just that the low to non-existence price. We've received many comments about how these books are much easier for them to read than traditional books how WAMAP is far superior to WebAssign, and how helpful they find the videos. I'm glad that wasn't me saying that, because that would sound all biased. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it, it's really fun for me. You know, I, I, every, every semester for like the last two years, I've been getting these, you probably can't read that. It, I get these greeting cards, these thank you cards from this college down in the Sacramento area. Uh, this guy, his name is Ben Etkins, out of the American River College. He 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 makes his students <laughs> send a send a thank you card every quarter, and, and it's so much fun to like read these nice little thank you for saving me a bunch of money, and <laughs> it was such a great book, and you know all these nice comments. Uh, so that's sort of where we're at. That's where things are at in the open world now. So so what's coming up? Where what's down the road? Uh, so the biggest initial boost, and this is going to be across all disciplines, is going to be the continued release of new open textbooks. Um, OpenStax College is this really interesting initiative out of connections. Uh, they're pouring stupid amounts of money into, into developing publisher level uh, open textbooks, complete with focus groups, peer reviews, and pandering to the middle. Uh, many, of, many of their books come with uh, instructor supplemental materials uh, and they're partnering with commercial um, companies like WebAssign to provide online homework. Uh, for everyone who's uh, looked at our pre-calc book ever and said, gee, those graphs are kind of fuzzy and I wish they had arrows on the end, uh, <laughs> just wait until this version comes out. Uh, this, this is going to be a largely expanded and, and 
slightly middleized version of our of our precog book, and it's going to have lots of lovely graphics and a toned down conceptual focus. Uh, <laughs> But it's generally good, and, and I'll probably be modifying it to be back what I want. Uh, because I can do that, because it's open. Uh, <laughs> seriously, it, is, it actually looks really nice, and, and it's, it's quite good. Uh, so, uh, some other co- cool, couple of cool things. Uh, the BC campus... Uh, in British Columbia, uh, has committed to developing open textbooks for the 40 top enrolled courses in BC. Uh, California did the same thing for 50 top enrolled courses, and happily they're actually talking to each other and they're not going to d- duplicate. Uh, California is being a little slow, they're dragging their heels a bit on getting it going, but uh, we'll see what happens. But, but even with all that, the most interesting thing that I, that I see is, is what's happening at colleges and in departments. Uh, a few cool examples. Tidewater Community College out in Virginia, they introduced what they call the Z degree. Uh, it's a zero textbook cost business associates degree. Uh, so students, there's a pathway through their degree where students can take all their courses with, with only open resources. Uh, and that's saving students a third of the cost of the program. Uh, the, the Virginia Community College system as a big whole is, is providing grants for producing openly licensed courses uh, built by multi-college teams, and, and they recently announced a second round. Uh, in many ways, it's really similar to the Open Course Library project in sort of the goal, except they're actually requiring the use of open resources, which is nice. Uh, in, in Arizona, the Maricopa District as a whole is, is doing this district-wide, all-discipline OER adoption campaign uh, called Maricopa Millions, trying to save students $5 million over five years. Uh, more locally, our friends over at uh, Tacoma started an OER project in 2012 to save students with the goal of saving students $250,000 by the end of June 2014. They reached the goal in April of 2013. Uh, so they're now calling it liberated <laughs> to 250. Uh, and, and one of the really cool things about their projects is that it was largely funded by the student government. The student government said, we want OER at our campus, let's do it. And they funded a position to, for someone to help support the adoption of OER at their campus. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to continue to see colleges, departments, and faculty uh, you really take ownership of, of their content. Uh, because really the new battleground in OER is adoption. Without book reps to make faculty aware of open books, you know, adoption for open books is kind of hard. Uh, you know, department, campus, and state efforts are helping, uh, as well as the you know, larger national attention and better overall awareness that open's getting. Um, in many ways, I'd argue our state is ahead of the curve. Um, we've got departmental adoptions of open textbooks at Green River, Shoreline, Pierce, Big Ben, Bellevue, We've got individual faculty using open textbooks at <gasps> Cascadia, Edmonds, Everett, Lake Washington, Seattle Colleges, South Puget Sound, Bellingham Tech, Tacoma, and probably others that I don't know about. So I'm going to close with a, a call to action. So remember that textbook selection is one of, one of the few ways that we as faculty can directly address access and equity, and ensure that all of our students have access to their course materials uh, on the first day of the course. And it may help to think about the return on investment, or at least if you're talking to your administration trying to get money, this may be helpful. Because this is the argument that policymakers are finally listening to. You know, does it make sense to have students collectively spending $300,000 a year for a textbook for one course at one college, when, when, you know, you could hire some people for $100,000 to write a book and then it could be used at every college indefinitely. But the real reason to heed my call to action is to make it yours, to be able to personalize. You know, think about how you teach your course. Think about what role does that textbook play in your course. You know, do you even need it? Do you you really hate those, how many coins do I have in my pocket questions? You know, do you have a hard time finding a book that approaches exponentials the way that you think it should be introduced? You know, make it yours. Find an open textbook to start with, use it as is, take out what you don't need, remove a section, add a section, edit the wording of the definitions if you don't agree with the authors, you know, because you can do that with open. You know, pull in review material from another text, because you can do that. That's what open enables. 
And maybe that openness will even reach into the classroom, what's called uh, open pedagogy. You know, where you have students engage in this, in this collective, collaborative, creating work that's become the sort of default on the internet. Our students are no longer consumers of information, they are creators, and yet in our courses they're often still consumers. Uh, you know, you can have students create a solutions manual for an open text if one doesn't exist. Uh, you can have them create suggested test questions for practice and then store them in your little departmental test bank. Uh, you can have them create videos explaining problems to other students. Uh, I mean, heck, you can even have them rewrite part of the textbook if you wanted to, to explain a concept better or create a new section altogether. I tried to have my 107 class do that once. Didn't work quite as well as I would have liked, but, but I'm going to try it again. Uh, so I, I, I just have one simple request for you, and that's, and that's look at an open course. You know, be critical, evaluate it, you should. I only ask that you use that same critical eye on the commercial books that you're comparing it to. A lot of us, I think, have gotten in the habit of just assuming that commercial materials are good. I, I, I like to say that there are stupendous commercial materials and there are commercial materials that are crap. And likewise, there are OER that are crap and there's OER that is exceptional. And remember that open textbooks and open books are not an all or nothing proposition like a commercial book. You can take what you like, ditch what you don't need, revise, remix with other material if needed. And of course, if you're feeling more ambitious, I certainly encourage you to contribute. And that doesn't have to mean writing a book. There's lots of ways to contribute. Uh, you can proofread, you can create new activities, add some new exercises, create some videos, or even join a collaboration of colleagues uh, working to create a new course or revise an existing one. Just share early and share often because that's how other people can take advantage of it. That learning machine is being built. I encourage you to join in. Thanks.